Hello friends. This is Revenger what if how are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto become the Devil King and get married with Rias Grammary. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. The sound of a pounding on the door drew the attention of the room's only occupant, namely a blonde-haired teenager, towards it, groaning as he stood from his crouching position. Walking over to the door, and ignoring the constantly growing pounding from the other side of the door, he reached said door and twisted the knob. Once it was open, the blonde was greeted by one of the many Anbu special operatives that served the village they were in, this one wearing a porcelain mask with a hawk-like visage on it. Yes, the blonde said, his tone rather clipped, showing that he was not happy being disturbed. Uzumaki Naruto, the Hokage and elders demand your immediate presence. The Anbu replied, the mask hiding any possible facial reaction he might have had towards seeing the blonde's face. For several moments, they stood in silence, before the blonde gave a sharp sigh, which gave the indication that it was out of annoyance. I'll be there in an hour, the now named Naruto replied, which caused the Anbu to tense at his words. I said immediate presence, so you'll be going now. The hawk masked Anbu said, while reaching out to grab the blonde, most likely to forcibly pull him out of the room, and more than likely all the way to the meeting place. His actions, however, were halted by Naruto's own, namely in grabbing the ANBU's wrist and tightening his hold until the bones began to make a cracking noise. I'm currently on downtime, so they're lucky I'm even showing up at all. Naruto growled out, his eyes giving off a small tint of red, thoroughly frightening the hawk masked Anbu. Now I said an hour, so it LL be one hour, he shouted out, while thrusting his hand forward, sending the Anbu flying back to crash into the wall at the end of the hallway. Scoffing at the downed ninja, Naruto turned back into his apartment, before slamming the door shut. Taking a calming breath, Naruto glanced around the place that he had used to call his home, or what was left it. Seeing the amount of damage that had been done, caused said blonde to groan internally, cursing the ignorance of the village that he had called home, for all these years. Remembering back to the source of this whole problem, Naruto recalled how just a scant three months ago that the entirety of the elemental countries had found themselves immersed in the fourth shinobi war. A megalomaniac by the Tobi, who had been posing as the infamous Uchiha Madara, had enacted his long-term plans, plans that had been in the works for years, to create a consolidated world, with him on the throne. To accomplish this, he had created an organization by the name of the Akatsuki, where the sole mission of its members was the hunt down and capture the nine most powerful creatures on the continent, the Kyu no Biju. His overall plan was, once he had gained possession of all nine beasts, to merge them back into the single entity that they had come from, and then, using their power, project the image of the Aeon Mangeku Sharingan onto the moon, thus enacting the moon's eye plan. This, hypothetically, would enable Tobi, who had then been revealed to be none other than the supposedly slain Uchiha Obito, to cast a perpetual genjutsu over the entirety of the world, where he would reign as god of all. However, his plans and calculations had all come to a grinding halt, thanks to the actions of one Uzumaki Naruto, who managed to defy his orders to remain on an isolated island so that Obito couldn't reach him, and joined the battle. Tapping into the recently liberated powers of the legendary beast inside of his body, namely the Kayubi no Kitsune, Naruto was able to turn the tide of the battle, allowing the newly created allied shinobi forces to regroup and try to re-coordinate their plans to stop the true leader of the Akatsuki. However, following the defeat of Uchiha Obito and the subsequent destruction of the large Zetsu army that had been created by the rogue Uchiha's machination, things had shifted, and in some cases, it was not in a good way. The villages of Kumogakure no Sato, Iwagakure no Sato and Kurgakure no Sato had been extremely grateful for Naruto's assistance though there were some fatalities on all sides of the fence, some of the more prominent being Karabi, the Reikage's younger brother, and holder of the Hachibi no Kyogyu, eight-tailed giant ox, Kuritsuchi, the granddaughter of the Sandame Suchikage, and Ao, personal attendant of the Godem Mizukage. Konoha and Suna, his supposed home and home away from home, however, had taken a severe change for the worst for Naruto. After bringing the Uchiha back to Konoha, he had been assaulted by his own teammates for completing his mission in promise. Sakura, she had beaten, well, attempted to beat would be the proper thing to say to a pulp, 
but he was able to throw her off rather easily, much to her shock and anger. With Kakashi, he had done nothing more than glare at him with a rather visible level of anger for what he claimed to be Naruto's audacity for injuring his Obito redemption project, while saying he was worse than trash. The term hypocrite seemed to fit right into this scenario rather well. As for the Uchiha in question, he had barely let Naruto have a moment's rest, since any time that Naruto had to relax, Sasuke would barge in on him, demanding fights to try and regain his Uchiha honor. Sai and Yamato. The former could care less about the Uchiha, but he had said that he should have handled it better. Maybe he should try fighting a life and death battle against the Temei without trying to get stabbed and electrocuted. The latter had been the same as Saw One Eye, but he had just left him to his own, and giving our hero the cold shoulder without even so much as a backwards glance. Team 10. Choji had insulted him and threatened bodily harm if he were to ever step foot in his office again. Ino had tried a Sakura and failed miserably at that, so she had tried relying on harsh words to get her point across. Shikamaru was like Yamato, just disappointed on how reckless Naruto had been in handling the mission at the time. Ha, huh, lazy bastard, let's see you try a hand at fighting Sasuke. He was nothing like Hidan had been. Team 11. Guy and Lee had called him unyouthful and all that bullshit, which Naruto could care less about. Tenten threatened him like Choji in the same manner, except that she would do it with her weapons if he were to ever step near her or her shop again. Neji reacted almost exactly like Yamato in some regards, but instead had went into his fates mode and had wondered if it was fate that Naruto had to mess up a simple mission. Oh, Naruto enjoyed the beating he had given the Hyuga then while explaining how he and the others would have met their fate if he or any of them had to face not only Sasuke, but Madara and Obito. In the case of Team 8, Naruto had to laugh at that event. Kuranai had only threatened with a torture session via Jinjutsu claiming to want to finish what should have been done on the day of his birth. Shino, being Shino, had only tried to dress him down via logic about how illogical he was in doing what he had did. To counter that, Naruto had pointed out the fallacies in his statements, one by one, leaving the Aburame in a conundrum of contradicting logistics. Kiba just did the same as Choji and Tenten, just with his dog added into the mix. Last he heard was that the said dog was still trying to get healed up after Naruto had set Tora after him. And then there was Hanada, the residential stalker of our blonde hero. Despite the fact that she had proclaimed her feelings for him, she had decided to go along with the trend as she had stated her disappointment in hurting his precious person, when he could have just as easily used words. And then she had to go on even saying that once they had gotten married, that she will train him to be a better follower and what not. She had not been able to locate said blonde ever since. He had no interest in the girl whatsoever, and if then it would only be platonic. As far as Naruto was concerned, her reading the riot act to him had burned not only any potential romantic interest he might have had, but she had completely severed any other interest at the same time. Since before I could walk, this village has pushed me around as much as they want. Somehow, I'm not too surprised that they would dump me to the side once I gained the strength to push back were the thoughts going through Naruto's mind. Glancing downwards, Naruto gave a slightly angered glance at his right arm, his Konoha Hite aid tightly gripped in his fist, which, responding to his emotions, began to pulse with a glowing red energy. Taking a few calming breaths, he was glad to see the glowing had subsided, which thankfully meant that for the time being, his new secret was safe, said secret being. What no one else knew was that during Naruto's final encounter with Obito Uchiha, who had still been posing as Madara, there had been a slight altercation that had taken place. Obito, realizing that he didn't have the needed strength to handle both Naruto and Karabi at the same time, had decided to send Naruto away for the time being, intent on sealing the blonde into his Kamui until he had dealt with the Eight Tails container. But once again, he had failed to take in his current situation, namely in the fact that while he took aim to use the Kamui, Interference in the form of a Yuki-covered fist from Karabi had been delivered to his face, knocking his aim off significantly. After the Dujutsu technique had ended, Karabi was a little green in the face to see that Naruto was mostly missing, mostly in that his lower body up to his middle stomach, as well as his right arm was lying on the ground, the rest of the blonde nowhere to be seen. Guess I'll put those thoughts on hold for the time being, Naruto thought while reaching into a jacket that no one in Konoha had ever seen him wearing, and pulling out a small plastic object that none of the villagers would ever be able to recognize, a cell phone. 
Hope this works. He thought out loud, while holding down the power button. Slowly, but surely, the phone sprang to life, showing that the dormancy it had sustained had recharged the battery to a single bar, and the signal, while not high up, would be enough. Pressing a few keys, Naruto was soon greeted by the, until a short time ago, familiar sounds of the call ringing in. Naruto? A crisp voice answered after a few rings. Sirzex, long time. Naruto replied, while smiling slightly at the voice he was hearing. It certainly has been. The now named Sirzex replied, his tone giving a hint of gratitude to be speaking with the young blonde once again. But it's been so long, I had thought you had forgotten about us. Not a chance, but suffice to say, I've been rather tied up here as of late. Naruto responded, while sitting himself on the floor and leaning on one of the only remaining pieces of furniture in the room, namely the bed, though only the frame was still in slightly usable condition. The Akatsuki got ambitious right after I got back, and it all culminated in the breakout of a war here. A war? Sirzek's voice was laced with concern mostly for the idea that Naruto had been ed into a conflict that more than likely wasn't of his choosing. I'd explain more, but I don't think I have the time, Naruto said quickly, while pulling the phone away to see that the battery gauge was blinking, showing that the internal battery was just shy of running out of power. I forgot to charge this damn thing before I left, and Konoha isn't exactly the most tech-savvy place in existence. I'm mostly calling to see if either yourself or Grafia could come and get me, I'm sure Grafia would be happy to get you, but what's the rush? Sirzex questioned. Let's just say that they've been sending me on dangerous missions one after the other since the war ended, but since I've been surviving them, I wouldn't put it past them to try something else. Naruto replied, while he could practically feel the anger rise through the phone at his words. Who dares try to hurt my Naru chan? A new voice, this one female and oddly enough young, sounding like it came from a much younger girl, suddenly cried out causing Naruto to freeze, both mentally and physically. After a moment or so, Naruto finally managed to speak. I called in the middle of a meeting, didn't I? Naruto finally said. I didn't see the harm in putting the call on speakerphone. Sirzex replied, with what Naruto could tell was a bit of a sheepish expression from his tone of voice. So what's this about your village putting you in mortal danger? Another voice spoke this one giving of an air of aristocracy that surpassed any of the daimyos that Naruto had met during the war. Ajuka, now's not the time. Sirzek's voice cut in again, remembering the warning that Naruto had given about his time being limited. Sirzek is right, so let's hear what the gaki has to say. A third voice said, this one male as well, but his tone gave the hint that he had either just woken up from a nap recently, or he was getting ready to take one soon. I just need someone to come and pick me up, since they're likely to send every Anbu and their mother after me when this is all said and done. Naruto spoke, while taking another quick glance at his battery gauge to see that it was still flashing, and he knew that there would only be a few minutes before it would die on him. Say no more, Naruto. Sirzek's voice replied. Just get yourself to an open area and use the seal. Someone will come and get you as quickly as possible. Right, I'll do that. Naruto managed to say, only to hear a sudden beep. Looking at his phone, Naruto saw the screen display a simple, powering down, message, before the screen went blank. Damn. Well, guess I'll get to it. Sometime later, we find Naruto standing out in one of the wooded training grounds within Konoha, this one being home to a small stone with hundreds of names carved into it, symbolizing its status as a memorial stone. Glancing around the area, Naruto saw the familiar forms of three wooden posts, each about six feet tall which caused a rather unpleasant memory to bubble to forefront of his mind. Flashback. You three won't be returning to the academy. The words of a man with silver hair that spiked upwards said, while his face was covered by both a mask reaching up just over his nose and below his eyes, while a headband with a metal plate on it was covering his left eye. His words were spoken to three pre-teens that were before him, two of them, namely a boy with black hair that oddly enough resembled the backside of a duck, while the other was pink-haired girl sat in front of a training post each. The third pre-teen, however, who distinguishable by his bright blonde hair, was tied to the middle post, while his eyes were narrowed in anger at his current situation. Instead, you three should be dropped from the shinobi program completely. Flashback end. Just shows how much of a hypocritical ass Kakashi was, because if he had actually been fair at that time, it would have been Sakura that was tied to the training post. 
Naruto thought at this point. True, he had come to many hard conclusions while he was on his two and a half year training trip with Jiraiya, but Naruto had felt the need, if only to try and be the better person, to give his former sensei one chance for redemption. And while he had been shown taking steps towards trying to earn it, Naruto had once again by slapped by harsh reality when Kakashi had condemned him for defending himself from Sasuke during the final hours of the last war. Glancing down at his left hand, Naruto saw a special seal that he had become rather familiar with during his training trip with Jiraiya on a small slip of paper, which was now glowing with an otherworldly red glow. Suddenly, Naruto tensed slightly at a new feeling that he had recognized, and without even turning his back to confirm, he could already tell that standing behind him was a large group of people that had little to no love for him. Looking back, he saw standing behind him was several squads of Anbu, most of the former rookies that he used to call friends, and standing at the front of this group was a woman whom he had seen as something of a surrogate mother to him, up until a few months ago, when that image he held of her was completely thrown to the wind. Well, guess I have some unexpected company. Naruto idly commented, more to himself than anything else, while noticing that some of the gathered were either glaring at him hatefully or giving him half-hearted glances, like they didn't consider him to be worth any of their time. Naruto, I had ordered you to report to the tower nearly two hours ago. One Senju Tsunade, Godem Hokage of Konoha, shouted out, while glaring angrily at the younger blonde, part from his blatant disregard for her order, but mostly from the anger at being denied his absolute obedience in the matter. Now granted, we had decided to give you some leeway in this, since you did assist in ending the war, but you still follow my orders. You, decided to give me some leeway, Naruto accused, while leveling his own glare at her, which caused her to take a slight step back from the sheer amount of anger in both his eyes and tone. Not only did I personally crush the leader of the Akatsuki, but I've also been forcibly taking non-stop S rank missions since the war was over. If anything, I owe you some leeway, which was given when you tried to force me onto another mission. Tsunade felt her anger rising at the younger blonde's words, even if they held quite a bit of truth, but anything that she was about to say was stopped, this time by one of the individuals behind her speaking. Naruto-kun, what are you doing? The meek voice of one blue-haired, pearl-eyed girl questioned, since she had seen that Naruto's outfit had changed from what they had expected of the blonde, namely in that there was no orange in this. Instead, he was wearing a set of blue shorts that went down to just past his knees with multiple pockets on the sides, with a black t-shirt on his torso, his usual sandals being replaced by shoes that they had never seen before. But the two biggest things that drew the rest of crowd's attention was the travel pack that the blonde had slung over his shoulder, while his standard Hite 8 was missing from his head. You would think that this appearance would be enough of a giveaway. Naruto idly commented to himself, while seeing some of the ninja there tense at his words. But since you all seem so slow, I'll spell it out for you. I'm leaving the village. I didn't authorize a training trip for you, so you won't be going anywhere. Tsunade called out which only caused a loud bout of laughter to emerge from Naruto, though the hollow sound that it gave off was somewhat unnerving to the gather shinobi. Who said anything about a training trip? Naruto chuckled out, while turning his amused gaze back to the assembled group. I'm telling you this, so listen carefully, because I'm only going to say it once. I'm through with Konoha, I'm done. Hypocrite. A new voice screamed out from Tsunade's left, this one being Uchiha Sasuke his eyes shifting from their usual charcoal black to being blood red with three tomo marks in each eye. You drag me back to Konoha against my will, but now suddenly, you have the nerve to try and leave here, I won't let you get away that easily, not until I pay you back for that humiliating defeat you gave me. You left this village to join a pathetic traitor for your own mindless need for revenge, revenge on a person who was following the orders of some of the people that are behind you. Naruto fired back hotly, while glaring at Sasuke who in Naruto's mind was still the same spoiled, arrogant brat that the village had catered to since he was eight. I'm leaving because I'm sick and tired of both the suffocating hate and isolation that this village condemned me to. You aren't leaving, Naruto, Tsunade said, while snapping her fingers, causing dozens of Anbu to surround the young shinobi, weapons drawn in anticipation for their attacks. You're too valuable of an asset to just let walk away. I fail to see how you can stop me, Tsunade. Naruto replied, a smirk visible on his face, while some of the gathered ninja felt a grimace cross their faces. It was a certifiable fact that Naruto was a powerhouse that few could match up with, and none of the ones that could were assembled here. 
You will show the proper respect to Hokage sama, one of the Anbu shouted, the one that Naruto recognized as the one that had tried to forcibly drag him to the meeting earlier, mostly thanks to the mask giving that away. Would it kill you to say please? Naruto questioned, the smirk still firmly on his face, while he gave a split second glance towards the small slip of paper held firmly in his hands, which had begun to glow brighter. Bastard! The same hawk masked Anbu roared out, while rushing towards Naruto, several of the other more sensible Anbu shouting at him to stop, all of which unheeded by their comrade. Boom a sudden blast of red energy suddenly flew by Naruto's head, impacting the same Anbu that had been charging, before said Anbu suddenly exploded, with a few particles slowly being blown away by the wind. Everyone there, with the exception of Naruto and those at the back of the crowd had been forced to avert their eyes at the explosion for fear of going blind while Naruto only had to avert his head slightly. I'm surprised that you came yourself, Naruto said, which instantly caused the other individuals in the field to open their eyes to see what he was talking about. There, behind Naruto, his hand lifted to show that he had been responsible for the attack, was a figure that none of them save Naruto recognized. He was male, appearing to be around early to mid-twenties in age, the most noticeable feature of him being the long crimson hair while his form was garbed in an elaborate silver and grey robe, with a large and elaborate golden shoulder dress armor that looked like a set of eight wings, four on each shoulder. If it's for an old friend, it's not an inconvenience, the man responded. You, identify yourself, Tsunade shouted, while her face held a look of slight panic at the strange and unknown power that was suddenly used on one of her subordinates. I'm called Sears X Lucifer, Sears X replied, while giving a slight mock bow to Tsunade. I'd say it's a pleasure, but I'm not very good at lying. I'm a little surprised that you managed to come alone, Naruto commented, while turning away from the assembled group of ninja to look back at Sears X. Who said I came alone? Sears X replied cryptically, which caused Naruto to give him a confused glance. Almost as if that was the cue, a strange and unknown circle appeared on the ground, glowing a blue color which once again caused the Konoha Nin to cover their faces from the blazing light. Once it had calmed down enough, they looked to see a terrifying sight. Pillars of ice blanketed the area, encasing some Anbu entirely in their frozen grasp, while some managed to dodge them enough to only suffer from severe frostbite. Yeho! Mahu Shouju Levi Tan has arrived! A new voice called out, one that Naruto knew rather vividly. Turning his gaze the source, he was greeted with a young-looking female, admittedly with rather large breasts, garbed in an outfit that only Naruto and Sears X recognized as being from a genre popular outside of the elemental countries called Mahu Shouju, Magical Girl. You brought Seraphal with you? Naruto questioned with a blush on his face, while looking back to Sears X who had a small smile on his face. I'm guessing you don't care too much for the surrounding area? Do you? Sears X replied. Nope, can't say I do. Naruto finally said after a moment or so of thought. Anything else he might have said was interrupted by the now named Seraphal launching herself towards him, wrapping her arms around his head and smashing his face into her torso, ironically, her breasts smashing right into his face, while her knees were situated around his ribs. Naru chan, did you miss me? Seraphal questioned, after she had had her fill of pressing the blonde's face into her ample chest. You there? Tsunade shouted while pointing Seraphal, her eyes narrowed in anger, though the shaking of her arms, both from the cold and the fear she was feeling did little to enforce her authoritative tone. You just attacked loyal shinobi of Konohagakir no Sato. As such, you are hereby under arrest. She then pointed towards Naruto, who was still holding Serfal in his arms, and Sears X. That goes for the red-haired man as well. And you, Uzumaki, are to be arrested and tried at once for crimes of treason attempted desertion and potential conspiracy. Even after all this, she still thinks she's the one in control? Sears X questioned, while looking at Naruto, who in turn just shrugged his shoulders in response to this. She's in charge of the most arrogant and bigoted cesspool on this continent, of course she still thinks that she's in control. Naruto replied, while Sears X couldn't help but let a chuckle escape at the blonde's words. Are you listening? Tsunade screamed out, while feeling her anger rise at the actions of Naruto and the new male beside him, seize them. At this, what Anbu remained, namely another thirty or so, as well as the assembled groups of Junin and Chunin drew their weapons in response to her call, and readied their attack. 
This was halted, to an extent, when another blast of ice entered the area, this one originating from another strange circle, this one glowing with a silver-white color to it, forming into multiple spears that impaled several unlucky Anbu as well as a few lower-ranked Nin. Yara Yara, you two can't seem to stay out of trouble, can you? Yet another new voice spoke out, which belonged to another female, this one appearing to be in her early to mid-twenties as well, with silver hair and eyes, while her hair, which was reaching down her back had two braids on each side with a blue bow at the end of each. The biggest eye-catcher, though, was the fact that she was garbed in a blue and white French maid outfit with long sleeves, a white maid headband over her head and red lipstick on her lips. Grafia san Naruto spoke while seeing her slightly narrowed eyes soften for a moment when they landed on him, before they returned to their narrowed expression at the sight behind said blonde. You intend to stand in the way of my orders as well? Tsunade shouted, while pointing an accusing finger at the newest arrival, only for said woman to ignore her and instead walk straight for Naruto, before enveloping the young blonde in a warm hug, while also mushing his face directly into her cleavage. I'm sorry we took so long, Naruto kun. Grafia spoke, while pulling the blonde's face away from her chest to give him a warm smile. I'm just glad you could come, Naruto replied. Arrest them, Tsunade screamed out, which caused some of the shinobi to instantly rush forward, while a few of the more sensible ones were initially terrified of attacking these new individuals. A glare from the first female Hokage changed that, as they too went on the attack. Hate to cut this reunion short, but I think there's business to attend to. Sirzex interjected, causing Grafia to loosen her hug on Naruto, as both of them turned to regard the approaching forces. Time to have some fun, E.H., Naru-chan? Seraphal questioned, while summoning a pair of circles, one in each hand. Yeah, time for some fun, Naruto replied, while smirking in anticipation of the upcoming fight. Three minutes later, Tsunade felt both her anger and fear rise to new levels at the sight before her. When she had summoned every Anbu and other ninja the village could spare, as well as the former Rookie 12 and their senseis to try and apprehend Naruto for his blatant disobedience, she had expected the young Uzumaki to kowtow under her demands like he had done before in the past. But this idea was soon shot down by the arrival of three individuals that she had never seen before, and with their arrival, the supposed, easy win for Konoha, had changed drastically. Bodies of her shinobi lay on the ground, either impaled by spears of ice or frozen from the inside out by the hands of the two females they had faced. Their initial beliefs of them being a mere maid and a child had been proven very wrong, since the two were dishing out the most punishment by letting their opponents suffer. Ino and Hinata were also encased from the waist down in ice, since they had felt that attacking the two other females would show that they were stronger than them, while also feeling rubbed about them being affectionate with Naruto on different levels. There were also scorch marks on the ground where several shinobi had fallen prey to the red-haired man's strange and unknown attack, which left little to no evidence behind. But the thing that seemed to anger Tsunade the most was that even with as many trained and potent shinobi being thrown at him, he was treating this battle more like a chore than a fight. The only survivor of his assault was Tenten, whose ever single weapon used against him had been vaporized without even a backwards glance on Sirzek's part. As for Naruto himself, he was proving once again that he was the most unpredictable shinobi in history, since he had taken down his own fair share of shinobi, some being simply injured and out of commission but there were some that he had killed. Currently, said blonde was holding the battered form of his former sensei, Hitaki Kakashi by the throat, said man glaring at Naruto with his still visible Sharingan eye, while Naruto couldn't help but smirk at his former sensei's attacks, or at least attempts at attacks. Lying on the ground around him were his old academy members, Kiba and Choji nursing broken arms, Shikamaru suffering from a broken nose, Neji and Shino with broken jaws, while Sakura was passed out with a shoe mark on her forehead. What's the matter, Hitaki, don't like getting beat by a teenager? Naruto questioned, the same smirk from earlier still on his face, which caused a growl to rise from the silver-haired Nin's throat. More like trying to figure out how the son of my sensei could perform such an act to loyal Konoha shinobi like you have. Kakashi fired back, while wishing he hadn't used so much chakra to try and take down Naruto like he had, since even now, he felt his conscious fading, while the blonde's grip on his throat wasn't helping at all. At the same time, he was hoping that by dropping that small hint about Naruto's parentage, 
he might gain a small chance to fight back during the blonde's moment of realization. You're one to talk, considering the hypocritical crap you've pulled over the years. Wasn't it your same sensei who always preached about showing fairness to each and every student that was under the Junin sensei's command? Naruto shot back, shocking Kakashi, both from the words ringing true in Kakashi's brain, but also from the fact that Naruto had used that particular pretext to respond. I know all about my parents, Hitaki. You can thank Jiraiya sensei for that. But what shocks me the most is that you have the audacity to try and use my father against me in this situation, when we both know that I'm not in the wrong here. You are in the wrong. Kakashi yelled out, while trying to regain his lost breath through the blonde's grip. Your father believed with all his being in protecting this village no matter what. For you to desert the village like you're planning to, you're worse than trash. At these words, Naruto lowered his head, as his bangs shadowed his eyes, which initially gave Kakashi the idea that his words might have had some kind of effect. Maybe so. Naruto spoke after a moment of silence, before lifting his head to show the same blood-red eyes with slit pupils that many of the village had grown used to seeing before. But here's the thing about that. I don't care. I'm through playing, devoted soldier, to this ungrateful hellhole, and it's time that I go and find my own place in the world, one that doesn't involve any of you. At these words, Naruto charged up what had become known as his signature technique, the Rasengan, before slamming the spiraling ball of energy directly into Kakashi's stomach in the same instant he let go of said man's neck. Adding a new twist to it, Naruto channeled his chakra into the sphere, effectively launching it out of his hand while continuing to drill into Kakashi's gut and sending him flying away. The sphere continued on its path, while taking Kakashi along for the ride, before causing the Cyclops Nin to slam into one of the surrounding ice pillars, before the orb exploded in power, taking Kakashi out of the fight. Last, and most certainly least of all, Naruto commented, before raising his hand to catch an incoming attack, namely a hand coated in lightning, at the wrist, before looking at his one-time former Genin teammate. Still so angry Sasuke. But what are you aiming this anger at now? Don't you dare play innocent with me, do ah? Sasuke began in an enraged shout, only for it to be cut off when Naruto twisted his grip, breaking Sasuke's wrist. Play innocent? Naruto replied. You've been ed into this festering vortex of hate, and now that you don't have any legitimate target for your anger, you're taking it out on me. Because you stole my pride from me. Sasuke shouted back while trying and failing to pry his broken arm out of the blonde's grip. I'm an Uchiha elite and for you to stand in the way of my greatness is unforgivable. Way of your greatness? Naruto commented idly, while twisting Sasuke's arm to a lower position, inciting another pained cry from the last Uchiha. Reminds me of an old cooking quote. You can't make omelets without breaking a few eggs. I think I'll rephrase that. You can't make a tough warrior without breaking a few bones. With this said, Naruto lashes out with a sidekick, smashing directly into Sasuke's ribcage, and causing a loud medley of snaps to echo out throughout the clearing. Sasuke, in response, gives a few painful coughs, crimson blood decorating his lips, before he collapses forward in pain, his body trying and failing to draw in the much-needed oxygen. All finished? Sirzex asked, while throwing another red sphere over his shoulder to smash into one of the last ninjas still in the area reducing him to dust. Yeah, I'd say so, Naruto replied, while delivering a small kick to the slightly stirring form of Shikamaru. Naruto. Tsunade shouted, while glaring angrily at the young blonde in question. For several moments, neither Naruto nor Tsunade spoke a word, each blonde staring at the other, either in disinterest or anger, from the former and latter respectively. Finally, after what seemed like ages, four words were spoken by the younger blonde, which gave an air of extreme disinterest. See to your wounded, was all Naruto said, even as Grafia and Seraphal gathered towards him and Sirzex, the latter lifting his hand and creating a glowing seal beneath their feet. Without even giving another glance back towards either his former friends or comrades, Naruto and the other three disappeared in a shimmer of light, leaving Tsunade to try and pick up the pieces. They should be back soon, almost as if those words were some unexpected signal. A familiar red circle appearing on the ground was the first sign that someone was dropping in, and when the flash of light cleared enough to see, Ajuka Beelzebub and Falbium Asmodeus were able to see the same three that had left a short time ago, along with a fourth person they both readily recognized. 
However, before either Ajuka or Falbium could say a word to their blonde haired friend, said blonde once again found himself on the receiving end of a tackle, hug from Seraphal. Sarah Chan. Naruto managed to get out, though his words were rather muffled, thanks mostly to the girl's surprisingly well endowed chest almost smothering him. I can't help it. I missed you so terribly, Naru Chan, she said, while pulling back enough to let the blonde get a much needed breath, before he saw her giving him a puppy eyed pout. Luckily enough, Naruto was saved from cracking under her cute pout, thanks to Sears X pulling Seraphal off of the blonde, giving him the chance to regain his feet. Beelzebub Dono, Asmodeus Dono. Naruto spoke, after seeing the other two figures in the room, and giving a slight bow towards them. Naruto, what have I told you about the formalities? Sears X chimed in from his spot, an amused smile on his face, which caused the blonde in question to laugh lightly at his words, while rubbing the back of his head in true Naruto fashion. Gomen, but I am standing in the presence of the Yandai Mao, four great satans, Naruto replied while feeling a real smile overcome his face at the sight of the five individuals before him. It seems like only yesterday that I just met them for the first time. At this thought, Naruto felt his mind drifting back to the event that had allowed him to meet the ones who would become his real friends, and in some ways, his new family. Flashback. There it is Gaki, Japan. The words of a significantly taller man spoke, his most noticeable features being his spiky white hair, which reached down to the back of his knees his form devoid of his usual sage-style clothes in favor of more, mundane, clothing. Namely wearing an olive-green shirt, loose-fitting gray pants, his usual shinobi sandals replaced with more conventional sandals, and his custom-made hite aid stowed in his traveling pack. Wow! That's so cool, were the words of his traveling companion, a shorter blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, who had also foregone wearing his customary clothes for newer, less obnoxious clothes that the older man had picked out for him. Blue shorts that reached down to about knee level, a simple white t-shirt covering his torso, and similar styled sandals on his feet as well. At first the blonde had been rather vocal about having to wear something with no orange on it, as well as having to remove his treasured hit to eight, but after some explaining and more than a little bribery, he had given in. Thanks for bringing me, Aero Senen. Naruto, I've told you to tone down on that nickname, haven't I? the older man, admonished with a slight thump to the now named blonde's head. Gomen, Jiraiya sensei. Naruto quickly corrected, his mind drifting back to the explanation Jiraiya had given about their sudden trip away from Konoha and into the wider world. At first hesitant about agreeing to leave the village for so long, Naruto had finally caved with enough pushing from Jiraiya, and when they were finally a fair distance away, the white-haired man had explained his reasons to Naruto. So, this is where we start out, the blonde questioned. Hi, we'll spend a few weeks getting you adjusted to life in the big city, at this, Jiraiya pointed to the now visible harbor of Tokyo, which had only become discernible a few moments ago, and once that is done, we'll take some time to explore this country before zipping around a bit. Arigato, sensei. Naruto said, while glancing back to the approaching shore of the nearest country to his home continent. Jiraiya had explained to Naruto that since he had been approved to take the young blonde on a training trip to extend for two and a half years, Jiraiya had foregone the initial idea of remaining in the elemental nations and changed his plans. He had given Naruto the excuse that he wanted the blonde to see the wider world outside of what Konoha, and the few places he had been to could offer, and in his somewhat scared state. From the idea of being away from where he had spent most of his life for so long, Naruto had failed to catch on to something else that Jiraiya had held back on adding. Several hours later, all right Gaki, first things first, we'll find a suitable living place for the time being, and after we settle in a bit, we'll start with sightseeing. Jiraiya spoke up, after disembarking the ship. Some of the crew had raised a few questions about both Jiraiya traveling with Naruto, as well as the few possessions they seemed to have. The older, white-haired man had easily shifted the questions by explaining that Naruto was his nephew, who had a falling out with his family, and that their lack of possessions was attributed to having to leave their previous home in a hurry. They had seemed to buy it, and after making it a distance, Jiraiya had breathed a sigh of relief, since he didn't feel like trying to explain where their clothing and such really was at. Ah, but I want to explore for a little bit first. Naruto pouted, his more excitable side bubbling to the surface as he took in the many sights and sounds of the city, from the thousands of people traversing the streets, 
to the different shops and stores that littered the area. You can have some fun after we settle in, so we don't have to worry about anything being lost or stolen here. Jiraiya replied, while giving a small smile at the blonde shifting from his hesitant stance back to the excitable loud mouth that he had come to know. I've been to this area before, and I'll be the first to tell you that pickpockets will jump at the chance of trying to rip off a new face for their money. Fine. Naruto caved in, while giving a slight huff of annoyance of his fun time being cut down. Happy that Naruto had finally seen the truth of his words, for the time being anyway, Jiraiya directed them towards one of the real estate buildings in the area, one that the white-haired sage had done dealings with before, and proceeded inside. Less than an hour later, Jiraiya held the keys to their new living area in his hands, one key that he gave to Naruto, while keeping the others for himself. All right, can I go explore now? Naruto chimed in happily, while practically bouncing on the balls of his feet. Please, 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 he practically begged his sensei. Okay, Jiraiya said loudly, his words not meant to sound angry, but more or less meant to quiet the young blonde down. Since we have a living area ready to go, I guess you can go exploring. But none of your ninja tricks. No wall climbing, no roof jumping, and absolutely no jutsu. Jiraiya added the last part in a quiet tone, since there were many people still in the surrounding area. Why? Naruto questioned, honest curiosity marring his face. Seeing his confusion, Jiraiya directed the blonde to walk with him for a short time, which Naruto did rather quickly. Because in the past few centuries, most humans outside the elemental countries have forgotten about the existence of chakra, let alone how to tap into it. As such, if people saw you walking up the buildings with no hands and no tools, or if they saw you suddenly spawn dozens of shadow clones, they would panic. And right now, with this being new and unfamiliar to this area, we would have a difficult time dealing with any kind of fallout. Jiraiya explained. Oh, Naruto said, while thumping his open left hand with his right fist, a look of realization on his face. Right, so as such, unleash in dire straits, no jutsu, Jiraiya said. Gotcha. With this word, Naruto turned to run off and do some exploring, but he was stopped in his tracks by a firm hand from Jiraiya placed on his shoulder. One last thing. At this, Jiraiya removed his hand from the blonde's shoulder and placed a single finger on the boy's head. Naruto felt the briefest flare of chakra spike from the older male before his finger was removed and Naruto rubbed the spot on his forehead. I applied a tracking seal, just in the off chance that you wander off somewhere and get lost. Can't I just summon, oh, right. Naruto started to say, only for Jiraiya's words from earlier to return to him, reminding the blonde that for the time being, use of their chakra was out of the question. Right, so I'll find you in a few hours, until then, don't cause any trouble. Jiraiya warned while hoping that the blonde's pranking side would remain under wraps for the time being. The last thing they needed right now was somebody annoying Naruto, and the person showed up sometime later, hanging by a lamppost by their underwear, covered in paint and chicken feathers. I can't for life of me understand how an academy student managed to do that to an Anbu captain and not get caught. Jiraiya thought, while noticing Naruto turn and bolt away, waving over his shoulder as he did. Several hours later, and, I'm lost. Naruto thought, while glancing around to try and figure out where he was. Even though the area he was in right now was scarce with other people, the words of his sensei were still pretty clear in his mind, and it was that reason alone that kept the young blonde from scaling a nearby building to try and find his way. Guess I'll just stay put until Aero Senen finds me. Naruto mumbled out loud, before taking a seat on one of the nearby benches in the small park he was currently in, even as the sun began to slowly set in the distance. But I'm so bored. It had only been a few minutes, and even now, Naruto could feel his boundless amounts of energy urging him to get up and keep moving, if only just to hold back the boredom of sitting around. Oh, and what do we have here? A new voice, male in sound, though there was a strange distortion to the voice, as though it was being spoken from underwater, suddenly sounded out, causing the blonde to whip his head around to try and find the source. Something that smells rather tasty. With those words, Naruto finally managed to find the source of the voice, namely a man with short gray hair and black eyes, which were rather distinct thanks to the glowing red iris surrounding them. His form showcased a ripped physique, which was easily visible through his tattered shirt, while his face was curled into a smirk. W who are you? Naruto managed to get out, 
while standing to his feet and taking a few steps back from the new, and rather imposing individual, who in turn took several steps towards the blonde. I guess I can honor you with my name, since you'll dead in a few minutes. You may call me Helbrin, and I'll call you, my meal. The now named Helbrin said, while suddenly lunging at Naruto, his hands out in a grabbing motion, while his mouth opened to show long fangs jutting out from his canines. Reacting quickly, Naruto managed to barely duck under the incoming charge and quickly moved past the attacker, but was completely unprepared for the sudden back fist to catch him in the face, sending him careening into one of the trees nearby. Feeling his face stinging from the hit, and his head throbbing from the impact to the tree trunk, Naruto opened his eyes, trying to clear his vision. Any attempt to move from his spot, however, was stopped by Helbrin reaching his hand out and grabbing the blonde by the throat, before hoisting him up to face level with his attacker. Damn it, he's so strong, Naruto thought, while feeling the hand on his throat tighten as he was brought closer to Helbron's face. I'm surprised you dodged that first attack, Helbron admitted, while his gleaming eyes locked in on the exposed side of Naruto's neck. But all you did was help me work up my appetite a bit. With those words, Helbron moved his head forward and drove his fangs into the disoriented blonde's neck, and began ing on the blood that was soon flowing from the opening. Naruto, for his part, gave a pained yelp at the initial bite, but as he felt his blood slowly being drawn out through the bite point, he felt his energy slowly leaving him, while also hearing an angered roar from inside his mind, which was obviously from the Kyubi no Yoko. Ah, so delicious. Helbrin crowed, after pulling his head back from his victim's neck, his mouth and lower face covered in blood which was also dripping down from his chin. And with just a hint of Yuki, it's a splendid meal he added as an afterthought. How, how do you know, about that, Naruto managed to gasp out, while seeing the cruel smirk on Helbron's face widen, the blood coating his mouth giving it an even more imposing look than before. Now, 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 that would be telling. Helbron admonished, while lowering his head back down towards the blonde's neck, intending to continue with his, meal. His attempt was thwarted, however, thanks to a sudden fist smashing into the side of his face sending the gray-haired man flying away, though he managed to right himself in midair. Landing on his feet and lifting his gaze, Helbrin narrowed his eyes at the individual who had the audacity to interrupt his meal. Can't leave you alone without you pissing someone off, can I Gaki? Jiraiya questioned, before he turned to face the blonde and felt his eyes widen in panic at the blood that was caked on the blonde's shoulder and shirt. What the hell did you do? Jiraiya questioned, while helping Naruto place a hand over the open wound slight wisps of red chakra streaming from the wound to show that Kayubi was trying to help it close up, even though it was going at a considerably slower pace than normal. I, didn't do anything, Naruto managed to get out, while feeling his vision begin to swim from the blood loss. This guy, just attacked me. Oh, another course for my meal. Helbrin chimed out, while grinning happily at this new addition, though he wasn't confident that this new arrival would taste as good as the one he really wanted. Naruto. When you get some energy back, try and get away from here. Jiraiya spoke, while standing straight and turning to face the maniacal individual who had attacked his student. Careful, sensei, Naruto gasped out. Trying to avoid taking any chances, Jiraiya moved with a speed that a man his age wouldn't have, and engaged Helbrin in close combat, hoping that would be enough of an advantage. A right punch was deflected to the side, which was then followed by an elbow strike from the left arm, only for the strike to be blocked. Shifting his feet, Jiraiya launched a right spin kick at the gray haired man, only for his target to duck under the attack, and using the minor opening, lashed out with a palm strike that hit the white haired man's stomach and launched him back. Regaining his footing, Jiraiya quickly snapped his eyes back to his target, only to find that he was no longer there. Spreading his senses and darting his eyes rapidly around the surrounding area, Jiraiya couldn't seem to find a trace of the attacker. I'm impressed. For you to move the quickly, I guess I can use a little more power. Helbron's voice seemed to call from multiple directions, and at the end of his sentence, multiple glowing red eyes suddenly lit up from the surrounding trees. Mentally cursing at the situation, Jiraiya was shocked by the glowing red eyes showing their forms to be dozens, if not hundreds of bats, flying from their hiding spots and surrounding the sage. As soon as they were within striking distance, Jiraiya lashed out in hopes of keeping them at bay, but even his skills couldn't stop all of them and he soon felt their fangs biting into his body at random points. After several minutes of this, 
The bats swept away from Jiraiya's form, revealing a tattered Sanin with multiple bite marks littering his body. The bats flew around a single point, before congesting into a solid form, which turned out to be none other than Helbrin himself. And now I'll finish you myself. Helbrin spoke, while moving at rapid speed and going for a direct attack into the battered Jiraiya, who was drained from both the attempts to swat the bats away, as well as the amount of blood that they had stolen. Launching the man back, with his hand around the white-haired man's throat, he bared his fangs and prepared for a short snack before returning to his main course. Let go of him, Naruto's voice yelled out, though the last part of it had become distorted as well, which caused Helbrin to turn and see what had caused this. The answer being that Naruto had regained his footing, while his entire form was now covered in a glowing red aura, which had begun to take the form of a fox, if the ears and tails of the aura were any indication. Oh, so you have some fight left in you? Helbrin questioned, while releasing his hold on Jiraiya's neck, and turning to face the blonde pre-teen. Rushing forward with a new speed, Naruto closed the distance between himself and the gray-haired blooder, smashing a full-force fist into the latter's face and causing him to reel back. Taking the initiative, Naruto managed to land a solid punch with his left hand into Helbron's stomach, which doubled the man in question over, before Naruto finished his chain. Charging up a ball of swirling energy, his now signature attack, the Rasengan, which was primarily blue, with a few hints of red shifting into it, Naruto drove the spinning attack directly into Helbron's face, effectively launching the man in question backwards and laying him out. Panting in exhaustion, both from the sheer amount of demonic energy that had been flowing through his body, as well as from the blood loss that was still plaguing him, Naruto felt the chakra cloak dissipate from his body, causing him to drop to his knees. Panting to try and quell the pain that racked his body, Naruto was suddenly stopped from his actions by a new and unexpected sound, which was originating from the downed form of Helbrin, loud bouts of laughter being the sound in question. Most impressive, he said, his body rising up from the ground to stand on his feet, almost in the form of a puppet rising up since he seemed to just lift up from his downed position, the damage from the Rasengan not even showing on his body, while giving the panting blonde his continuous smirk but it's not enough. Growling in anger, both from the words of the grey-haired male, and also from the fact that his attack had seemingly done nothing, Naruto grit his teeth in pain and managed to regain his footing as well, while feeling more of the potent Yuki rise up inside him to attempt to form the cloak again. His attempts were stopped when Helbrin flew forwards at speed that Naruto couldn't track, grabbing Naruto by the neck once again and driving him back to slam into a nearby light post. Gasping in pain from the impact, Naruto, out of sheer instinct, lashed out with a right hook, but his hand was caught before it made contact with the intended target. Grinning maniacally, Helbrin gave a quick twist, snapping the blonde's wrist, which caused a pained cry to erupt from Naruto, which was then quickly silenced by Helbrin increasing his grip on his victim's neck, cutting the sound off instantly. Since you've worked up my appetite, I guess I'll be needing some more sustenance. Helbrin spoke while leaning in to give Naruto the same amused smirk that had been practically plastered on his face this whole time. But I don't think I'll kill you, no, your blood is too tasty to simply drain you dry and be done with it. I think I'll keep you around, if only to have a constant meal until I get bored of you. With those words, Helbrin dropped his head back down, intent of taking more of the blonde's blood, but for the third time that night, something blocked him from his meal. Quickly pulling away from his downed target, Helbrin saw a glowing crimson sphere slash through the air where his head had just been, before the attack seemed to curve in midair and attempt to strike again. Releasing his grip on the blonde, Helbrin dodged the second attack, before having to try and dodge several more spheres that were sent his way, effectively forcing him a distance away from the downed blonde. This attack, it can't be, Helbron shouted out, before one of the spheres smashed into his shoulder, blasting the limb off of him before another one crashed into his lower back and blew a hole through his lower torso. Gah! I finally found you, Helbrin Kuhn. A new voice spoke out, its tone giving an aristocratic feel to it, before the source of it revealed itself to be a man appearing to be around early to mid-twenties in age, the most noticeable feature of him being the long crimson hair, while his form was garbed in an elaborate silver and grey robe, with a large and elaborate golden shoulder dress armor that looked like a set of eight wings, four on each shoulder. I must admit, you've been able to mask your presence rather well, to the point where even I had some difficulty finding you. But, your little rebellion ends here. Sears X, Helbrin gasped, 
while gritting his teeth in anger at the newest arrival. Ajuka kun was rather angered when you fled from his peerage, and even killed two of your fellow peerage members as you did. Sirzex commented, while a dozen crimson energy spheres ignited to life around his body. But since we didn't want to risk another confrontation with heaven, I offered to find you myself instead of Ajuka tearing apart the human world to find and kill you. Am I supposed to feel honored, that the leader of the Yandai Mao would track me down personally? Helbrin snarled out, while regaining his feet and trying to slowly inch away from the battle area without being blatantly obvious about it. Why do you even care? One stray devil shouldn't merit this kind of attention in the first place. You might be right about that, Sirzex replied, before two of the spheres lashed out, one taking off Helbron's left leg from the knee down, while the other blasted off his left hand, effectively stopping the magic that he had been trying to cast. But the fact remains, you stand a significant chance of revealing not only us, but the entirety of the supernatural world, to the mundane world as a whole. And since we can't afford to divert the resources to erasing that right now, it is a smarter strategy to simply wipe you out before you cause too much damage. Besides, one devil killing another is something that will be ignored by the other two factions, even if it is me that did the act. Kuso. Helbrin screamed out, as his damaged areas seemed to bulge and expand outwards, before soon shifting to repair the damage that Sirzex had done, but the effect still left him panting in his kneeling position. It never ceases to amaze me, the regenerative abilities of vampires. Sirzex comments, as he walked towards his down target, the remaining ten red spheres surrounding his body seeming to double in size during the movement. But even still, this ends here. No it do, Helbrin began, only for one sphere to crash into his face, essentially erasing his head from existence, while the other spheres slammed into the rest of his body, effectively destroying the deranged grey-haired vampire. Well, that takes care of that part. Sirzex comments, before glancing over to the downed forms of white haired man and blonde haired boy. But what to do with these two? Walking closer to the younger of the two individuals, Sirzex was able to see small wisps of red energy drifting of the youth's body, centered primarily on the now closing wounds on his neck and around the damage to the young blonde's wrist. Feeling his eyes narrow in confusion, he reached out to take hold of the blonde's chin lifting his head upwards to gaze into his eyes, which he was shocked to see were a crimson red with slit pupils instead of round ones. Karama, Sirzex whispered, as Naruto's eyes shifted back to their sky blue color, before his exhaustion caught him finally, causing his eyes to close and his head to sag. Flashback end, it wasn't that long after that I was given yet another revelation to swallow. The blonde thought, while seeing the Grafia had begun scolding Seraphal for her impromptu tackle, hug, while Sirzex had begun speaking to Ajuka and Falbium. Flashback, after his bout of unconsciousness, when Naruto managed to awaken again, he was surprised to find himself in a rather lavish room, several cables running from beeping equipment, which Naruto barely recalled belonged in a hospital, down to his body, two attached to his right arm, and two more to his chest area. Regaining enough of his mental facilities to remember what had happened, Naruto sat up in panic at the memory of the deranged grey-haired being that had attacked him and Jiraiya. However, a hand reached out and placed itself onto Naruto's shoulder, causing him to whip around in fear of seeing the same being again. He was relieved, slightly, when he saw that it wasn't the grey-haired male that had attacked him before, but another person, this one female. The first thing he noticed was her beauty, which caused him to blush, since she had almost shining silver hair and matching eyes the former of which was mostly flowing down her back, while two portions were fashioned into braids in the front and held by blue ribbons. It would seem that you're feeling well, it wasn't so much a question as it was a statement, which caused Naruto to break out of his staring and turn away, his blush seeming to magnify at the way her voice sounded. H hi. Naruto managed to sputter out, his tone a few octaves higher than it normally was. That's good. She spoke, while pushing the young blonde back into the bed, before reaching to the table nearby and picking up a cloth that had been setting in a basin of water. Taking the cloth in hand, the woman proceeded to wring it slightly, removing the excess moisture from it, before speaking again. You had a slight fever from the attack earlier, but it broke just last night. Were, were you here? Naruto began, only to trail off at the end when she turned her gaze back to him. All night, since my master and husband asked me to monitor your condition, she finished, and then decided to elaborate on. 
Her words caused a new blush to rise over Naruto's face, while he glanced away towards the wall, while his hands had suddenly found a new hobby of twisting the sheets, which gave Naruto a split-second note that they felt extremely smooth and comfortable. A. Hey, arigato. Naruto managed to speak, while maintaining his eye contact with the wall, until he felt the woman turn his head back towards her, before placing her forehead to his. She held it for a moment, before pulling away, leaving the blonde with a cheery red face from her action. Well, your temperature seems to have returned to normal. The woman spoke out, causing Naruto to return to reality, since her actions before had pushed him off into a slight fantasy world, mostly because someone was actually tending to his health. Your older companion is still recovering in the other room, so I think you should take some more time to rest as well, I'll return with your meal in a short time. Ah, Matt. Naruto spoke quickly, after seeing the silver-haired beauty turn to leave. I didn't ever get your name. The blonde added, only to suddenly stop and blush again, since his words ha come out at a slightly higher tone again. Turning back towards the young blonde, a small smile graced her face, seeing his actions and mannerisms reminding her quite a bit of her own child. My name is Grafia Lucifuge. Flashback end. Naruto-kun, Sirzex spoke, while waving his hand in front of the blonde's face, trying to snap him back to reality. Naruto-kun. He repeated, while snapping his fingers, this time managing to bring the blonde's attention back to them. Ah, Goman, just remembering the past. Naruto commented, while realizing that the five other occupants of the room had stopped their own conversations or scolding, and returned their attention to the single blonde in the room. Just got a feeling of nostalgia, since the last time all six of us were gathered, it was almost two years ago. Time sure has flown, at least for us, Naruto-kun. Ajuka commented, while finally getting a chance to shake the young blonde's hand, which had been prevented earlier thanks to Seraphal. In my case, it was one grueling battle after another, with no end to the tyrannical actions of the Akatsuki in sight. Naruto replied, while a small scowl crossed his face at the memory of the same organization that had tried to forcibly rule the world, killing countless people to do so. But that's over now. He added on, while trying to bring his mood back from the edge that he had been living on for so many months now. I'm surprised Jiraiya didn't decide to tag along with you. Falbium spoke while the four males noticed slight grimaces appear on the face of Seraphal and Grafia at the mention of that man. They would admit that he had his own kind of strength, and he might have been slightly eccentric, but at the same time, they would have to give some credence to his training methods bearing fruit. But the man's constant perversion was a driving force behind several attacks on his person, both by the two women in this room, as well as several others over the two and a half years he had been there. Only at the sight of the solemn expression on Naruto's face did the five devils realize that they might have touched off on a tender subject. Jiraiya Sensei was killed about six months ago, by the puppet leader of the Akatsuki. Naruto said softly, his eyes watering slightly at the memory of how he had learned of his teacher's death. From Fukasaku, who had informed Naruto that Tsunade had ordered the information to be withheld from him, but the elderly toad had decided to ignore her words on the matter. He had new information about the, at the time supposed, leader of the organization, and went to follow up on the lead. I was denied the chance to accompany him, since Tsunade didn't want to risk their greatest asset against the Akatsuki on just a wild goose chase. Naruto spoke the last few words with such venom, it was impossible to miss. I'm so sorry, Naruto-kun, Grafia said after a few moments of silence, before pulling the blonde into a hug of her own. Feeling her warm embrace, Naruto's resolve finally caved, and he sobbed out, letting out both the sadness at his teacher's death, and the anger at Tsunade for trying to withholding the news from him like she had attempted. For several minutes, not one word was spoken, a calm silence permeating the air, as the four devil rulers allowed their young friend to grieve properly. Finally, after several moments, Naruto seemed to finally calm down enough to pull back from the hug, quickly wiping the remaining tears on his face, not wanting the others to keep worrying about him. Arigato, Grafia-san. Naruto managed to say. Feeling a hand fall onto his shoulder, Naruto turned to see the source of it being Sirzex. Do you know what happened to his body after the battle? Sirzex questioned, his tone oddly serious, given that in the few years that Naruto had knew him, he was one of the most laid-back individuals he had known. I don't know, Fukasaku told me that he was in aim when he passed, but he was more than a little rushed to try and get me to the Toad's homeland for training. 
Naruto replied, while seeing Sirzex frown in disappointment. Realizing what Sirzex was getting at, Naruto's hand flew through five hand seals, before biting his left thumb and quickly smearing the blood that was flowing onto his right palm. Kachiyose no Jutsu. The blonde intoned, while slamming his hand down onto the ground, a spider web design of kanji spreading out about a foot from the blonde's hand, before a puff of smoke spewed out. Now in front of the blonde was an individual the other five had only seen once or twice, a small green toad, only about a foot tall, with a mohawk style for his white hair, thick eyebrows and a small goatee. Naruto-chan, I was wondering when you would summon me, the small toad spoke. Fukasaku, I'm guessing you know what I've done. Naruto questioned, while seeing the small toad had a serious expression in his face, before it morphed into a knowing smile that helped put the blonde at ease. Hi, the Ogama Senen foresaw your desires to leave Konoha, and it was then that he presented an ultimatum for myself and Shima. We could either assist you in leaving the village, assist Konoha in recapturing you. At those words, the five others in the room tensed slightly, red to intervene if the elderly toad made any wrong moves, only for a slight hand gesture from Naruto to stop them. Or we could stand back and do nothing. You chose the last one. Ajuka spoke. It wasn't a question, it was a statement, which caused the elderly toad to turn and give the aristocratic devil a hard look at his words. Actually, we had gone with a combination of the first and last options, since Shima and I agreed to intervene in the off chance that Konoha got the upper hand against Naruto-chan. Fukasaku responded, while smirking at the sheer level of surprise that was radiating from the six others in the room. What, did you expect me to say that the toads, who value honor and trust above all else, would agree with the Leaf Village's actions as of the past few months? I wasn't sure how you would react to me abandoning Konoha. Naruto managed to speak, after regaining his voice from the revelation that had just been delivered. If it wasn't for the off chance of Katsuyu would have found out, the toads would have taken you from the village after the war was over. But sadly, relations between the toads and slugs have been rather strong for long enough that Katsuyu would have enough sway to find out about our actions and then assist Tsunade in finding you. Fukasaku replied. But that matters little now, since you are here and Konoha will be recovering from the damages for a time. Now, I would assume that you summoned me for a reason? Like you don't already know that? Naruto replied, before losing the amused, annoyed smile, and turning serious. I need to know exactly where Jiraiya Sensei fought against Nagato, or Pain as you call him, in Rain Country. Oh, I was wondering when you would ask that one. Fukasaku said, while giving Naruto a serious expression, which was matched by the young blonde. Luckily, you don't have to go far, since Gamakichi was able to retrieve Jiraiya's body after his defeat. He's been laid to rest in Mayobokuzen, Mount Mayoboku sealed inside of a specialized tomb of my own creation and lined with seals your parents designed for their own burial sites. My parents are buried there too. Naruto spoke, his tone filled with disbelief, since all of his searching under the radar back in Konoha had not been able to yield any information on where those two had been buried. It was your father's wish from when he signed the toad contract, since being a shinobi, he knew that there was a chance he could be killed at any time. Fukasaku admitted, while crossing his arms and giving a reminiscent smile at his first meeting with the young blonde who would one day rise to be a sulfur monosulfide rank ninja and later Yandaimi Hokage. Your mother was a little more difficult to happen, namely for the fact that Tsunade argued with Jiraiya Chan and myself about her rights to choose Kashina's resting place, citing the Uzumaki and Senju families being connected. But Kashina had been adamant that she wanted to be laid to rest with her husband, and so Tsunade's hands were tied. I, had no idea, Naruto spoke softly, while idly questioning on why Jiraiya would withhold that kind of information from him. Don't be angry with Jiraiya-chan for not telling you about this earlier, it was decided that until you learned the truth about Konoha's real methods, it was something that should be kept close to the chest. Fukasaku answered the unspoken question. When you are ready, I'll personally take you to see all three of them. Arigato, Fukasaku-sensei. Naruto said while giving a respectful bow to the elderly toad, who waved off his thanks, before disappearing in another puff of smoke. Turning back to the others, Naruto saw they hadn't moved from their initial spots, more than likely as a way to let Naruto do what needed to be done. Naruto. Ajuka spoke, drawing the blonde's attention solely to him, the other four devils all looking at the holder of the Beelzebub title as well. What did Fukasaku Dono mean by, 
when you are ready. For a moment, Naruto didn't say or do anything, other than shift his eyes from Ajuka, to Sears X, Graphia, Seraphal, Falbium, and back to Ajuka, before releasing a sigh, which seemed to be more of resignation than fatigue. About that, Naruto began, while lifting his left hand to rub his face, trying to think of how to word this next part properly. Sears X, I was hoping you could do me a small favor. Feeling a sigh of content escape his lips, Naruto settled down onto the large bed in an equally massive bedroom that Sears X had set aside for him to use. The bed itself was easily double king size, with sheets that felt softer than silk and a medium red in color, while the comforter was a darker red tone. The room itself was alternating between tones of red primarily, with hints of gold and black to balance the design out, with a desk in the far right corner, and three doors in total, one exiting the room to the hallway the second to the large closet and the third to the blonde's own private bathroom chamber. Guess I better get some sleep, tomorrow starts my new training, Naruto thought idly, while pulling the sheets up to his chin and crossing his arms behind his head, his mind drifting back to the conversation that he had finished up a short time ago. Flashback. A favor, Naruto-kun? Sears X questioned, his curious gaze locked on the young blonde before him. Yeah, about something important. Naruto replied, while withdrawing his hand from his head, his eyes giving a barely noticeable glance to his inner wrist as he did this. During the climax of the Fourth Shinobi War, the actual leader of the Akatsuki revealed his hand about what he planned to do with the biju he had been collecting. Essentially, he intended to combine them back into the original biju, what many knew to be the Jayubi, and then use its power to cast a perpetual illusion over the world. Human arrogance at its finest. Ajuka spoke out his tone laced with a mixture of annoyance and thoughtfulness. I agree. Pride may be a cardinal sin for devils, but this bastard took it beyond anything any pure blood devil could hope to achieve. Naruto replied, his mind recalling some of the haughtier and more obnoxious devils that he had encountered during his time away from Konoha. Long story short, the man in question, Uchiha Obito, whom everyone had believed to have perished during the Third Shinobi War, wanted to use the power of the ten-tailed beast to create what he called the moon's eye plan, which would create an everlasting genjutsu over the world, with himself as the ruler of all. He actually thought this plan would work? Falbium questioned, the others shaking their heads in disbelief at the man's foolish ambition. Hell if I know, but he was dead set on making it happen, to the point where he declared the fourth shinobi war in his attempt to make it happen. After a short standoff between Obito's army of cloned Zetsu soldiers against the newly created allied shinobi forces, it all came down to a clash between myself and Karabi, the container of the Hachibi no Kyogyu against Uchiha Obito and his newly made subordinates, six of the former containers of the other biju. Naruto continued, his eyes hardening at how he and Karabi had been forced to destroy the animated bodies of their fellow Jinchuriki on Obito's orders. It took some time, but we eventually found ourselves facing Obito, and even though the two of us were worn out considerably, we still had a significant chance of beating him. Something tells me he didn't want to take a defeat at that stage. Sears X spoke, his tone showing that he was giving a rather accurate guess. Right. Naruto responded, before a spark of pain lanced through his form, which was noticed by the other five occupants in the room. Clenching his right fist and gritting his teeth, Naruto closed his eyes, almost as if in concentration, while gripping his right wrist with his left hand. And this is the result of that. As those last words left the blonde's mouth, an explosion of power blasted out from Naruto's form, managing to send the other five individuals around him backwards from the backlash. They managed to right themselves in midair and land without problems, but when they turned to regard their blonde haired friend, they took in the sight before them with shock and awe. Along the visible portion of Naruto's right arm, from the sleeve down, they saw his skin had changed into red, scale-like covering, while his fingers now resembled claws. Then, with a sudden ripping sound, red claws also appeared on the blonde's feet, which had torn through his shoes, before he collapsed to his knees. For several seconds, no one dared move, until Naruto lifted his head to look at the five devils before him which allowed them to see his eyes had now taken on a black sclera while his iris had gone from their normal sky blue to a golden color with black slits for pupils, before his head dropped, a pained cry escaping his lips. At that sound, Ajuka and Sears X, the two most powerful of the group, surrounded Naruto, their hands reaching out towards the blonde, 
glowing seals appearing from their outstretched hands. As one, they worked their magic, slowly managing to taper off the power raging around the blonde, slowly but surely. After a few moments, the energy dispersed, though the changes to the blonde's body, namely the scales and claws, were still visible. Sighing in relief, Naruto lifted his head back up to show the other five occupants the sight of his eyes bleeding back to their normal white sclera, blue iris, round pupil form. Naru chan. Seraphal spoke softly, her face awash with confusion, which was mirrored by the other four pure blooded devils in the room. That, Naruto began, his voice coming in ragged pants, was the end result of Uchiha Obito trying to win the war. What happened, Naruto kun? Grafia's own inquiry seemed to speak the words that the others were also thinking, while placing a hand on his back, which seemingly helped the blonde overcome the painful aftereffects. I can only guess that Obito realized his chances of defeating myself and Karabi were slim at best, so he decided to even out the playing field and increase his odds of victory. Naruto spoke, his breathing starting to even out, while feeling the energy from before swirling just below the surface. He used one of the special abilities of the Mangekio Sharingan, called the Kamui, which can create distortions in space and time, on me, I'm assuming to send me away until after he had dealt with Karabi. And something happened in the process. That's what you're getting at. Ajuka surmised, since logic dictated that the blonde wouldn't be telling them about this unless it bore some relevance to his story. Got it in one. To be more precise, Karabi happened, since he noticed Obito's plan to divide and conquer, and tried to stop it before it could happen. It would only be a guess, but I'm thinking that the combination of the natural energies of the Mangekio Sharingan and the potent Yuki from the Hachibi must have mixed and distorted the Kamui. And this ties into your transformation? Falbium questioned, his expression and tone surprisingly devoid of any of its usual sleepiness. Thanks to the distortion that Karabi unknowingly created, the Kamui didn't send me into a pocket dimension like originally intended, but into a separate plane of existence. Naruto answered. It was there that I met the being who saved my life and helped me learn that I was in a place called the Dimensional Gap. Nani? The five devils cried out, their faces a mask of shock and terror, which made Naruto mentally smile since he had expected this reaction. Naru chan Seraphal cried out, while rushing and hugging the young blonde, her expression one of abject terror at this new bit of news. Initially surprised by the sudden embrace, Naruto was quick to both recover and return the action, wrapping his arms around the young Mao's back. Can't say that I'm all that surprised by their reactions. After all, it's not every day that someone can enter the dimensional gap and not perish. Naruto thought. Wait, Naruto-kun. Ajuka spoke, drawing not only the attention of the blonde in question, but also three of the four other devils as well. You said that it was there you met, the being that saved your life, but there's only one recorded being that resides there. Still as deductive as always, Ajuka, Naruto spoke after a moment, which in turn caused Seraphal to pull away from him slightly to stare at his face at this point. Known by names such as, the Apocalypse Dragon, and, True Dragon, it was the being known as Great Red who saved my life. The Dragon of Dragons, Sirzex gasped, his expression of shock mirrored by the other four devils. This reaction did cause a bit of a mental smile to cross Naruto's face when he saw it. It was because of Great Red's interference that I'm still here right now. Naruto spoke, breaking the other five out of their thoughts on the subject. The damage from the distortion in the Kamui was rather severe, but Great Red supplied a way to return me to normal, well, as close to normal as possible. Damage? Grafia questioned, her tone giving a somewhat cool feel one that Naruto instantly recognized from the times when his training had been pushed a little further than a mother like her would have liked. The mixture of the Hachibi's Yuki and the energies of the Mangekio Sharingan altered the destination, but the attack by Karabi also cut the Kamui off earlier than Obito had intended. Naruto managed to speak, while feeling a slight sweat begin to manifest from Grafia's hardened stare. Meaning? Grafia pressed, her tone and expression caving the blonde's resolve to hold back that bit of information. The attack bisected me at the stomach, and I lost my right arm in the process. Naruto finally cracked, while at this point, he lifted his shirt to show them proof of his words. Once his shirt had been lifted upwards, sure enough, 
The four devil leaders and the strongest queen were able to see a the sudden change from normal flesh to a more scale-like composition as it went downwards. For several seconds, Naruto kept his position like that, before dropping the shirt and then rolling up the sleeve on his t-shirt to show his right arm, which also bore a similar skin tone shift around the bicep. Great Red managed to reconstitute that much of your body? Ajuka questioned, his tone laced with the same inquisitive nature that many had come to know him by over the centuries. Not quite, Kurama used his power in combination with Great Red's flesh to rebuild my body from the damages of both the Kamui and the erosion effects of the dimensional gap. Naruto elaborated, while unrolling the sleeve of his shirt to cover his upper arms. Unfortunately, the energy from the Great Red's flesh was far more powerful than Kurama's energy, so this new body had more of a tendency to the dragon blood inside it. Hence this form? Falbium questioned. Correct. Kurama's residual energy was able to hold the energy back, but since Kurama is no longer residing in my body, it was only a matter of time before this happened. I managed to create a specialized fuinjutsu to hold back both the power and the change for as long as possible by trying to dissipate Kurama, remaining energy throughout my form, but four months of constant missions drained it. Naruto continued, while gesturing to his inner right wrist where the seal in question once existed. So, your favor has to do with this transformation? Sirzex questioned, though his tone gave the feel that he already knew the answer to his own question. Yes. Thanks to this new influx of energy that replaced Kurama's, my control over my chakra has been completely shot. Add to the fact that this new dragon energy is far more potent than Kurama's and you can see where my problem lies. I was able to fight like I did when leaving Konoha, simply because I used the last of the energy from Kurama that balanced my own chakra and the new energy from the dragon power. So, you need training to regain your control, Falbium surmised. Well, I don't see a problem with that. Sirzex said, while giving Ajuka a glance at his words. We'll make the necessary arrangements, but for now, you should get some rest. Nodding his head in agreement, Naruto turned his attention to Grafia, who had gestured to the young blonde to follow her to what he would guess was his old room. However, a sudden call from Ajuka stopped Naruto in his tracks, and then turned his head to regard the holder of the Beelzebub title. There is something that I forgot to ask, Naruto-kun. Ajuka spoke which then caused Naruto to regard him with a confused expression. Should we be concerned with a possible attempt by your former village to track you down and take you back? After those words had left Ajuka's mouth, Naruto felt a smirk slide onto his face, before a chuckle then left his lips. The small chuckle soon turned into laughter, which lasted for a few minutes, until the blonde Uzumaki managed to rein in his emotions, and turned back to the Yandai Mao. Gomen. Naruto managed to say, while stifling a few remaining chuckles with his hand, but the idea of Konoha actually managing to even make it to Japan, let alone the underworld, by their own power, was a pretty funny thought. So no worries from you, Grafia spoke, while Naruto first gave a small smirk to her, before turning back to the other four devils. Not really, Naruto answered. The barrier surrounding the elemental countries is fueled by an insane amount of nature chakra. Trying to breach it is a colossal task for any human since the amount of energy required to breach the barrier is just as much as the amount used to sustain it. Jiraiya managed to overcome this with a combination of Fuinjutsu and Kurama's power when we left the elemental countries and returned to them. Your own transportation powers are able to bypass it completely in their own way, and since all of the biju have either been released or returned to the villages, they won't have a way to breach the barrier on their own. So they are essentially trapped. Ajuka surmised his hand to his chin in thought. Unless some outside source interferes, then yes, Naruto answered. Flashback end, mentally smiling at the memory, Naruto knew that he was in for a rough time for the foreseeable future, but at the same time, a sense of relaxation had washed over him, one that he hadn't felt since before his return back to the leaf village. It's like I've returned home, Naruto thought, while turning onto his side, his face scrunched up in thought at those words going through his mind. Who am I kidding? Konoha was never my home, it was my prison. This is where I belong now. With those words, Naruto once again rolled over on this back, now staring at the upper canopy over top of the bed, before closing his eyes, allowing himself to have his first real night of sleep in over 18 months. Some time later, slowly, consciousness returned to Naruto, and as it did, he quickly noticed something about his current position, or rather two important things. 
the first being that there was a slight amount of extra weight pressing down on his chest, and the second being that he now felt strange warmth flooding through his body, radiating from his chest area. Groaning out loud, more from the fatigue he was still feeling than the extra weight, Naruto cracked open one of his eyes, his vision altering to allow him to see in the darkness of the room. But when he focused on the source of the weight, he was only somewhat surprised to see the slumbering form of Seraphal, her hands, which were placed firmly on his chest, were giving a soft blue glow, which would explain the warmth Naruto was feeling. She must be using her magic to help me sleep. Naruto thought idly, before he noticed that his groan had been loud enough to wake the slumbering Mao, causing her to yawn cutely into her hand, before turning her gaze to meet Naruto's. Oheo, Naru chan, Seraphal said, while rubbing her eyes a bit. I think it's still night time, Sarah chan. Naruto commented, which caused her to smile at him while sitting up, which in turn allowed the blankets to pool around her waist and show Naruto another important fact she didn't have a stitch of clothing on her body. Even her hair, which Naruto had always seen as being separated into twin pigtails on opposite sides of her head, was let down, allowing her almost glowing black hair to drape down along her back. Say Sarah chan. Naruto managed to stutter out. It's something that I wanted to do. Using my magic like I was requires me to be naked, which was an added bonus in my book, she said her expression rather mischievous. Oh. Naruto managed, while quickly turning his head away to try and calm his nerves down from the sight before him. A arigato. He managed to say, before she placed a hand on his cheek and drew his gaze back to her, causing him to notice a slight saddened expression had appeared on her face. It was so mean of you to not contact us while you were gone. She began, and when Naruto was about to speak, her hand moved from his cheek slightly, and a single finger was placed on his lips, which was enough indication for him to know she had more to say. I already know from Sirzex that it was a slight mistake with your phone, but even still, I missed you so much. Add to the fact that too much interaction on our part could have sparked a new war, we couldn't even try and check up on you. Seraphal continued before removing her finger from Naruto's lips and then using both arms to hug herself to the blonde. But I'm glad that you're back here with us. For several moments, Naruto said and did nothing as he let her words sink in, realizing that because he had neglected to find a secondary way to contact his friends, or family as he saw them, they had been left in the dark for over a year and a half. Harsh realization spilled over him, as the simple fact that he had made those he cared about worry endlessly over him finally set in. Goman. Naruto finally said, while wrapping his arms around Seraphal's supple frame, his mind only giving a small notice to how this mushed her breasts into his chest. Go Menasai. Shinpai Shinade. Seraphal responded, while smiling happily at having Naruto's arms around her. You're back, and that's all that matters now. At these words, she pulled back slightly, smiling up at the blonde, before pushing herself forward slightly and planting her lips onto Naruto's. Stretching his arms over top of his head, Naruto felt a small yawn escape his lips, not from actual fatigue, but from the sheer level of relaxation that he could now take part in. After close to a year and a half in the village of Konoha, where many civilians and shinobi were still out for his blood on a daily basis, it felt nice to be able to let his guard down for a time. Glancing downwards, Naruto gave what felt like the thousandth grateful look at his new training clothes, namely a pair of relaxed dark blue shorts and white tank top. It may have been true that Naruto had a liking for his orange clothing back when he was a preteen, but as the years had gone by, he had severely fallen away from the color so much. The only reason for his return to that color for his clothing after his training trip was because of his need to maintain the image Konoha had of him, namely a naive fool. Ah, glad to see you're awake, Naruto-kun. Sirzek's voice spoke out, Drawing the blonde's attention back to the man in question, Seraphal, Ajuka, and Grafia following after him into the clearing that Naruto was in. Ironically, it was the same clearing near the Mao's main castle that Naruto had taken to use repeatedly when he and Jiraiya had been staying there for the two and a half years away from Konoha. Also, walking with the four high ranking devils were three others that Naruto remembered from the time he had been on his training trip. The first was a man appearing to be in his late twenties, wearing the uniform of what Naruto had learned to be the Shinsengumi uniform from well over a century ago. Namely, the uniform consisted of a light blue-colored haori and hakama over a kimono, with a white cord called a tasuki crossed over the chest and tied in the back. This was Okita Soji, 
Sears ex knight and former captain of the Shinsengumi first unit. The second individual was another male, this one standing at least two meters tall and appearing to be in his mid thirties. The most distinguishable features of this male were his spiky orange hair, the thick coat covering his frame, and a bottle of sake held in his hands. This was the being Naruto knew as Surtur II, a rook in Sears ex peerage and a formerly abandoned project from the Norse gods. And the third individual was another male, this one seemingly in his late twenties, whose appearance could only be described as bewitching. This was due to the long slits of his eyes, shallow smile, and slightly wavy hair that is a mixture of black and blonde. But the biggest factors of his appearance was the crimson robe with a distinguished design and a significantly creepy aura that seemed to radiate from his very being. This was McGregor Mathers, or Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, Sears ex bishop and former co founder of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Comfy bed or no, I'm not one to turn down an old fashioned training session, Naruto replied which caused a smile to cross Sirzek's face. Finishing his stretches, Naruto stood back to his full height, which thanks to the actions of the Great Red and Rei constituting his body had thus allowed the blonde to catch up on the lost physical changes his time in Konoha had caused. I take it you're ready to start your new training regimen? Sirzek questioned, which was answered by the blonde with a nod of his head. Turning his attention to Ajuka, the aristocratic devil's hands, in turn, created several small glowing circles in the air, which then showed four suspended items in the center of the circles. Namely, what appeared to be two wristbands and two ankle bands, both primarily black and red in color, with a golden band through the direct center. A gift for you, Naruto-kun. Ajuka spoke, while the wrist and ankle bands floated towards Naruto, who first glanced curiously at them, before returning his gaze back to the holder of the Beelzebub title, his expression curious. After our discussion ended last night, I took the opportunity to examine the energy you were releasing, namely both the frequency and capacity of it from earlier. Combining this knowledge with my previous encounters with Kurama's energy, I was able to create a suitable replacement for your method. Meaning, Naruto began, while taking one of the wristbands into his hand, noting that it was a lot heavier than its small size would have indicated. Twisting it slightly in his grasp, Naruto then found several seals on the metal ones that Naruto recognized as energy-altering seals and control seals. Essentially, these four items will work in tandem and help to control the excessive dragon energy inside of you, Ajuka replied. But they will only work as a way to control the energy, not the catalysts. Naruto nodded his heads at those words, realizing what Ajuka was saying. The wrist and ankle bands would be able to restrain his energy, but they wouldn't be able to return his form back to its normal, humanoid form. However, a simple illusion seal will be a suitable solution to that issue. Ajuka finished, while taking one of the bands and showing the seal in question, on the outside of each of the bands. Arigato. Naruto spoke softly, before quickly fastening the band to their respective positions, where they seemed to shrink down to fit perfectly with his frame. Now that this matter has been attended to, we can shift focus to your request for training. Sirzek spoke out, after a moment or so which had the instantaneous effect of pulling Naruto's attention to him. As per your request, I've called in a few of my subordinates to help with your training. I'm sure you remember Soji-kun, Surtur, and McGregor. At each name, the male in question gave a nod of their head. During training sessions with me, we'll be retraining your speed and reaction time, well past what it was before you left here over a year ago. Soji spoke, which was answered by a bow from Naruto something that made Soji smile at seeing the proper Japanese form of respect. I'll be in charge of figuring out where you stand physically, and then we're gonna push past your old limits in all areas. Surtur said next, this time drawing a nod and a grin from the blonde. At the request of Sears ex Sama, I'll be the one in charge of helping you harness and control your new dragonic energy, as well as balancing it with your own chakra. McGregor finished up, with Naruto once again bowing, this time to the mage of the group. At this point, Naruto both heard and sensed a new presence in the air above, turning his head skyward to see what the source of it was. As soon as he did, Naruto was greeted with the sight of a large purple western dragon, which was beginning to descend down towards the group. And it seems our final guest has arrived. Sirzex spoke, as the dragon landed on the ground, the last few flaps of its wings kicking up loose dirt and leaves from the ground. I don't believe you two have met, so introductions are in order. Naruto, meet Tanin, 
a former Dragon King who also holds the title of Blaze Meteor Dragon, now an Ultimate Class Devil. Tanin, this is Uzumaki Naruto, the individual that we discussed last night. So he's the dragon you wanted me to help with? Tanin spoke, while lowering his head down to regard Naruto, who in turn continued to stare back at him. For several moments, no one in the clearing tried to move, allowing the former Dragon King to inspect the young blonde. Finally, Tanin pulled back from his inspection, though his eyes remained trained on Naruto even as he did. He doesn't look like much. Care to test that theory? Naruto fired back, his hands clenching into fists at the slightly off-handed tone that Tanin had used. Reason being, it reminded Naruto of the way that Sasuke and Kakashi used to act back during the earliest days of Team 7. However, Naruto was in for another surprise, when Tanin threw his head back and let loose a loud laugh at the blonde's words and tone. Ha ha ha, but full of fire, Tanin finally said after he had calmed down somewhat, even as he returned his gaze to Naruto. I think he'll make a splendid dragon. Well, now that that's all settled, I think we can begin. Soji decided to say, instantly regaining Naruto's attention. Hi. Konoha, same time, taking another long pull from her sake battle, Tsunade slammed the now empty container back onto her desk, not even caring that she had shattered the bottle in the process. Growling in anger, she reached for another bottle, hoping to try and relieve the sheer rage she could feel coursing through her veins, all because of one person in particular. Uzumaki Naruto. For over 12 hours, Tsunade, her apprentice Shizun and the most skilled medic Nin that the village could offer had worked non-stop to save the lives of what shinobi they could after the failed attempt of detaining the blonde Uzumaki, with Sakura joining in on the task after she had regained consciousness. They had finally succeeded in stabilizing the few Anbu that had survived, as well as the now rookie Eleven and other miscellaneous Junin and Shunin that could be saved, quickly downing what she could barely remember as her fourth bottle so far. Tsunade once again felt her anger rise at the situation she had found herself in. Following her appointment as the Godem Hokage of Konoha, Tsunade had been quickly informed by the Elder Council, which at the time had consisted of Yutatane Kaharu, Maitokado Homura, and Shimura Danzo, of her predecessor's agenda. Her former sensei, Serutobi Hiruzen, had been subtly planning for years a method to coerce and control one specific individual in the shinobi village, Uzumaki Naruto. The Elder Council had also been in on this particular plan for well over a decade, pushing and prodding at the right times to help the situation along, such as causing unrest within the civilian populace to lash out at Naruto, then Serutobi playing the caring grandfather to ease his problems. It was the hope of the four elderly ninja that their subtle machinations would be able to create the perfect countermeasure against the other shinobi villages in the form of a submissive and naive Jinchuriki. There had been a few interactions that could have thrown this whole plan off kilter, such as Naruto's academy instructor, Amino Uruka, who had managed to overcome his hatred for Kayubi and saw the blonde as an actual human. There were also a few Junin as well, such as Midorashi Anko and Gekko Hayate, as well as Anbu member Azuki Yugo, who had stood up for the blonde and tried to help where they could. However, standing orders from the Sandame had kept their interactions to a minimum on threat of military charges and prison time for disobeying his orders, regardless of the fact that they were helping an innocent child. However, even with all of these things thrown in the blonde's way, Uzumaki Naruto had proven time and time again that he was a wild card that few could comprehend and practically no one could rein into an acceptable level. Many had attempted to curb the boy's abilities, Mizuki, Hitaki Kakashi and Ebisu to name a few of them, but each found that despite their best efforts, Naruto was able to keep on advancing to new levels on his own. But if there was one event that had occurred that the elders and the Sandame had done their best to ensure never happened, it was the meeting between Naruto and the Gama Senen, Jiraiya. Jiraiya had known instantly who the blonde was upon first meeting him, but had not once approached the older cage on the matter, for fear of his old sensei banning any interactions between the two of them. But he was able to teach the boy using his place as Konoha's resident Fuinjutsu master as an excuse to spend more time with the boy, quoting the need to maintain the seal's integrity and ensure the Kayubi doesn't break free. But it was only after Jiraiya had taken Naruto on his training trip that Tsunade had begun to see the mistake she had allowed to happen shortly following her appointment to Hokage. It gave Jiraiya practically free reign to teach Naruto whatever he wanted. As such, 
Both Tsunade and the elders had hoped to once again stunt and cripple the boy's progress by removing Jiraiya from his daily goings and using others, such as Hitaki and Yamato to hinder Naruto's progress once again. However, it would soon become obvious to Tsunade and the elders that even with this new plan being set into action, Naruto was still able to achieve new levels even without his mentor there to help him along. Snapping out her mental tirade, Tsunade turned her attention to the sound of her office door opening, before the wizened forms of Yutatane Kaharu and Maitokado Homura appeared. Sighing out loud, Tsunade set down her sake bottle, and straightened herself out somewhat, but her haggard appearance did little to give any authoritative tone she might be trying to set. We were informed that you and the medics had finished stabilizing the ninja. Kaharu spoke firmly, while Tsunade could hear the hidden message she had been trying to use. If by, the ninja, you mean, the Uchiha, then yes, we managed to stabilize him, along with the other survivors. Tsunade replied, which caused a grimace to cover both of the elders' faces. It was no real secret that both Kaharu and Homura had been spearheading the machinations behind Sasuke's treatment in the village following the Uchiha massacre. However, due to injuries sustained, Uchiha Sasuke will be out of commission for quite a while. Injuries sustained. Homura repeated. Correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't you the greatest medic nin in the elemental countries? Why would Uchiha Sama be out of commission for any period of time if you were here to heal him? As I stated, because of the injuries he sustained. Tsunade fired back, which was answered by a confused stare from Homura and a grim expression from Kaharu. During the last attack by Uzumaki to Uchiha Sasuke, it seems that the brat infused a large dosage of Akayubi's energy into the kick. The energy is severally diminishing the healing capacity of any medical jutsu that we use on him, so the only two options are either continuing to waste energy on turning a snail's pace into a tortoise pace or wait for the energy to dissipate on its own. Neither option is acceptable. Kaharu spoke out, though in the back of her mind, she knew that even infections of normal chakra could be bothersome to work around, much less energy from a near infinite culmination of malignant yuki. But it is the hand we have been dealt. Tsunade responded in kind. Several moments of silence followed after, before it was finally broken. This is a disturbing development. Homura began, his face set in a mask of anger to match his voice. The Kayubi brat was never supposed to be this powerful. How could he have achieved this kind of power? By all accounts, he shouldn't have reached this kind of level. Tsunade replied back, each of his instructors, from his academy days up until his genin cell time, with the exception of one, all swore that they did anything and everything they could, sans expulsion from the ninja forces, to make sure that Brad never became a serious threat. It was your damn teammate, the disgraceful pervert, who must have caused it. Homura fired off, which was answered by a nod from Tsunade at his words. That is the best logical explanation. Those two and a half years away from the village, I will admit that I only realized the repercussions to that situation after I had agreed to let it happen. Tsunade admitted. But biggest issue is how to contain this situation now. Kaharu added. With the Kayubi brat loose like he is now, there is no guarantee that he won't take a chance and attack the village at some point, not after every unfair action we might have allowed to happen. Tsunade could only nod her head in agreement at this remark. It wasn't so far outside the realm of believable thoughts, to them, that Naruto might return and take some form of vengeance for everything that had happened to him in the village. Our only choice right now is track him down. Tsunade finally spoke, which was answered in kind by nods from both Kaharu and Homura. Where should we start? Homura questioned, which was answered by a grin from Tsunade, before said blonde cage pulled a manila folder from inside one of the drawers and placing it on the desk. Even though I had mistakenly agreed to allowing that training trip of Jiraiya's to occur, I did manage to order a report on the situation after it had finished. As such, we know every place that Jiraiya had taken that brat to. Tsunade answered. But even still, two and a half years of traveling. That still leaves a lot of locations to check and with so few active shinobi right now, Kaharu spoke, which was met with grim expressions from both her former teammate and the current Hokage. Thanks to the failed attempt to apprehend Naruto, half a dozen Enbu squads, along with dozens of Chunin and Junin had been killed, with just as many being injured in the attempt. As such, it made the number of available shinobi to participate in this search slim at best. We'll send word to Suna and request additional support. 
Gara's opinion of Uzumaki has taken a severe nosedive since the end of the war, so I don't see him as having a problem with assisting in this task. Tsunade suggested. But we must maintain a low profile on this matter. If any of the other shinobi villages learn of this, they might seek out the brat themselves. Or even worse, if any of the countries where he has made an impression were to learn, it could cause more problems than we can handle at this time. Kaharu added in. Agreed. I'll send a messenger bird to Suna and request their aid, and then find out who we can spare for this mission. Tsunade said with a tone of finality in her voice, her eyes narrowed in anger at the actions that Naruto had performed earlier, both in abandoning the village and also in his attacking her shinobi. Mark my words, Uzumaki Naruto. You won't be having a peaceful moment in your life, so long as I am drawing breath. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.